Thanks for joining me here again at ButNowMinistry.org and today we're going to look at part two of how Bible study operates in your life and what study methods, disciplines, and study helps are of value to you. And we concluded part one with 2 Timothy 2.15 in your King James Bible. It only says in your King James, it only says this in your Bible, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now your new your denominational, non-denominational churches, like the one I went to, Harvest Bible Chapel, I call it Harvest Translation Translation Chapel because they don't use a Bible. I never heard the word rightly the words rightly divide in that church the whole the whole eight years I was there. Why? Because they didn't have a Bible. I never heard the word study. Okay, Their idea of a Bible study there was in a small group setting. And small group, by the way, is not in your Bible. And you would go through a study guide by Navpress or a study guide by John MacArthur or a study by, guide by um, Paul David Tripp. Okay? Those seem to be the big hitters. Okay, and it was according to what those people thought. Unfortunately, that's not what Bible study is. God clearly tells us what Bible study is. It's rightly dividing the word of truth. And Nav Press and John, Mac the John MacArthur's and the Paul David Tripps and and the uh, Bill Hybels and the James McDonalds, they don't rightly divide. Like I said, I had never heard that word, those words before until somebody told me about my Bible, my King James Bible. And now my Bible study consists of about one to two hours every morning, uh, one to two hours of listening to sermons and reading various books. And then one, it's, about, it's about three hours a day. Okay, between reading and listening to sermons and studying my Bible, um, reading different books and, and whatnot. And then also knowing how to use a concordance now. And where before I never used a concordance. I never um, knew that I could get definition out of my Bible. I never knew that I could use it as a dictionary. I never knew that I could use it for doctrinal application. I never knew that I could use it for historical application. I never knew that I could use it for, um, I only knew, I'm sorry, I only knew that I could use it for spiritual application by taking every Bible verse out of context. We didn't study um, words word by word or even verse by verse. We studied the Bible again by using somebody's um, pamphlets, agendas, studies that were already pre-made and unfortunately that's not what Bible study is. That's someone else's Bible study for sure, just passing it down and most of the time like I said because we didn't know how to rightly divide, we never even knew that, that church doesn't even know how to do that. Um, they never study their Bible. And because, you know, when you're in these kinds of settings with the denominational, non-denominational churches, and because they don't have a final authority, they don't believe God's perfectly preserved word, the King James Bible, they use whatever translation they want. And again, the majority has taken the minority text by using the Roman Catholic Sinaiticus Vaticanus text. Um, they'll never, ever know these words, rightly divide, and dispensation, and study, and and it's it's a shame it's sad so again most of my christian walk before i learned the bible rightly divided was reading the bible which was always out of context and it was always to make me better um, i'm sure you guys have done that you know where you you read every verse and you insert your name in it and that's funny because the bible is not about me or you the bible is about israel and the bible is about the lord jesus christ but yet, when you go to these denominational, non-denominational churches, they turn it into a self-help book, and you're in every verse. And then they'll take verses, and all they're doing is applying all these verses out of context. They don't know the context of it. They don't know who God is talking to who and what God is talking about and 
how God is interacting with man at that time versus this time. And they don't talk about the contradictions in your Bible. That's right, there are contradictions. There are hundreds of contradictions in your Bible. Unfortunately, they don't know how to handle them, so they mix them all together, and that's why they said there's no contradictions. When there clearly is. But most of the books modern Christianity offers is always about how we can do better. Have you ever noticed that? I've noticed that since my, my library has completely changed. Some of the books would include being a better prayer warrior, being better spiritual warrior, learn how to have a better integrity, how to be a better spiritual leader, how to do better in your finances, how to be a better witness for Christ, learn how to tie your shoes better, learn how to be a better giver, right? Tither? Oh yeah, for sure. Is any of this working? There are hundreds of books about these different topics. Not too many mature Christians, I guess. That's why we need those books? I don't know. When was the last time someone preached the gospel of the grace of God with you on the street or at church or at work? You know, and that's what's amazing to me. Instead, none of these um, books that they offer tell you how to understand the gospel with clarity, tell you how to study and rightly divide your Bible. It's, it's never about that. Tell you how to understand what's going on with Israel in your Bible. Tell you how to understand what's going on with the church, the body of Christ in the Bible. Tell you how to be a new creature. Tell you how to be an ambassador. Tell you how to reckon yourself dead. It's never about that. Never ever in the Christian bookstores. There was, there's not one book. I worked at a Christian bookstore and you can look at, you can go to any Christian bookstore that's out there, your family Christian bookstores, and you will not find one book about Rightly Divided. You will not find one book about the mystery of Christ, the revelation of the mystery. The mystery is history. And like I've always said too, when you look at church history, it's a mystery too. The church, the body of Christ, is a mystery today in Christian land. There's no doubt about it. The books that I've been studying now, okay, because I got rid of most of those, those books are like packed away or in a far off bookcase, you know. The books I study now is all about Christ and His church, which is His body. The books that I study now are all about textual criticism. The books that I study now is the Bible and how it will work effectually in me. Now I trust in what Christ has done for me and the whole world. Also how to defend biblical Christianity and think about that. Who at these churches stands up for anything? Do they stand up for the doctrine? Do they stand up for their Bible? Do they stand up for textual criticism? Do they stand up for the gospel of the grace of God? Do they stand up for right doctrine, sound doctrine? They don't. They don't. No one does there. They don't know what sound doctrine is. It's amazing that when, fortunately, I was always... And, and this is what amazes me, too. I was always Paul's, Pauline in my, um, I always went to Paul's letters, even though my church always taught everything but Paul's letters. I always went to Paul's letters rather than the Old and New Testament, but did not have a firm understanding that that wasn't part of the New Testament. I did not have an understanding that, would, that that was separate and apart from the Old and New Testament, and it's called the Revelation of the Mystery. You have the Old Testament, you have the Revelation of the, you have the New Testament, and you have the Revelation of the Mystery. Those are the three things that are in your Bible. Okay, most of Christianity only teach Old and New Testament, including they include Paul's writings as the New Testament. But when you understand your Bible. Literally, you will read that in Exodus 19 and Ezekiel 
36 and Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, the Old and New Testament was only given to Israel and the house of Judah. So how could that, how could the church, the body of Christ be part of that? It can't. If you make it part of that, then the Bible is wrong and you're right. God is false and you're true. And then again, that goes against Romans chapter 3, verse 4, where it says, Let God be true, and every man a liar. So right now, what seems to be very important in my study is more on the King James Bible, the books that you recommended from <coughs> different authors, um, such as, you know, Believing Bible Study and the Cambridge History of the Bible, and the different books on the different translations, like so many versions, and the Alexandrian cult, and the Christian Liars Library, and the language of the King James Bible, and the NIV, a contemporary translation, and Double Jeopardy by the, the NASB update, and New Age versions, and... All, none of those books. Which Bible? Modern Bible translations. The Bible in English. Errors in the King James Bible. I had never heard of these books at my church. Never, ever. The men behind the King James Bible. None of these books were in the Christian bookstore. The history of your Bible. None of those books are in your Christian bookstore. None of them were at my church. And it helps to understand how the Bible was put together, how there are two different texts out there, one of Alexandria, one of Antioch, one of one that is called the majority, one that's called the minority. That will help your Bible study tremendously too if you're struggling with the fact that there's only one. With and Because ultimately you're struggling with the final authority. If you're using multiple translation, then there's no truth. If any version is okay, then there's no truth. There's no final authority. And then, when you learn how to study the different issues so you can defend them, you need to learn about water baptism. You need to learn why it's wrong. You need to learn why tongue talking is wrong. You need to learn why when people say Israel is, there's it, the Israel today is the Israel of the Bible. That's wrong, and you need to show them why it's wrong with the Bible. Okay? You need to have a firm understanding of the different Gospels in the Bible so you can explain to people the difference between the Gospel of the Kingdom and the Gospel of the Grace of God. You need to be able to explain the difference between Pentecost and when the church body of Christ actually started in Acts chapter 9. You need to be able to understand the book of Acts. You need to be able to understand the book of Matthew and the book of Hebrews because they're all transitional books. And this is what's not being taught today in the denominational, non-denominational churches. Most don't understand that Exodus 19 is when the Old Testament starts, not in Genesis chapter 1. And most don't understand that the New Testament starts when Jesus Christ dies on the cross. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17 gives us confirmation of that. They believe that it starts at the beginning of Matthew. Thus, making Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before the cross New Testament, which is horribly wrong, on the authority of God's perfectly preserved word, the King James Bible. That's why it's so important to study your Bible and lay this stuff out. So that way, when you are talking to somebody, you can give them Bible truth.
spiritual gifts is another one um, that people have a hard time with in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 12, 13, and 14 right? spiritual gifting the charity chapter which is not the love chapter and the tongue talking that's 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 you need to understand how that works so you can talk to people about it. How about signs and wonders? How about the miracles? Is that going on today? You need to be able to explain why it's not going on today. How about prayer? Do we ask God and we get whatever we want? Or do we not know what to pray for? Does prayer today give us something from God or does it strengthen our inner man these are things that you need to study out so that you can be that ambassador for Christ Colossians 125 wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God Paul's writings are the laws we follow today, 1 Corinthians 14, 37. That's another thing that you have to talk to people about because they will think they're trying to keep the Ten Commandments, which none of them are, and none of them sell all their possessions. Most of them probably just celebrated Christmas. So they have to sell all those things they just got from Santa. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Commandments. Okay. As I grow in grace, and in Paul's writings, rightly divided, the rest of the Bible, prophecy makes more sense. Where before I came to understand all this truth, I was, my old church at Harvest, was always in the Old and New Testament doctrine, and very rarely did we go through any of Paul's writings, and nothing was rightly divided, like I had said. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A tremendous resource now, and it never was before, is my strongest concordance. Also the understanding of chaining the same words together, and where the word presents themselves dispensationally rightly divided and what God is doing with the words with what audience it's amazing it is when you ask yourself who God is talking to to who what God is talking about and does the church the body of Christ fit in understanding and knowing that the church the body of Christ didn't start till Acts 9 and it doesn't go on until um, through the book of Philemon okay from Acts 9 to Philemon Okay. are the writings for the church the body of Christ but you also have to keep in mind that you have to rightly divide Paul's writings because he talks a lot about Israel and the same thing with the Old and New Testament you have to rightly divide the different audiences in, in those books you have to rightly divide the different ministries you have to rightly divide the different gospels you have to be a skillful workman. The other study method that is a tremendous help is the dispensational chart, okay? And that is something that I'm going to be posting soon on my site. You have to lay out a dispensational chart. You have to start with heaven, God making the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1-1. The earth is all of Israel, prophecy, the heaven is all of now the dispensation of grace, the new creature, okay, which was kept secret since the world began, and one was known since the world began, okay. And when we write out this chart, and you'll have this chart with you, and you should be able to write your own chart so you can explain people and take them through the chart, through progressive revelation of when Adam and Eve were, well, when God made the heaven and the earth. And then he created Adam and Eve, and then sin crept in, and then there was the flood, and then there was the Tower of Babel, and then there was the Ten Commandments, and then there was Jesus, and he was born of Mary, and then there was his earthly ministry, then he died on the cross, and then there was Pentecost, 
and then he was going to issue his wrath in Acts 8. Then he saves the Apostle Paul in Acts 9. And then the Apostle Paul is given the gospel, the grace of God, where people get saved today without any works, without, any, without anything that they have to do, just trusting in what Christ did for them, dying on the cross, and being buried and rising again on the third day. He paid for our sin, trusting that, and we're saved. And then the church, the body of Christ, meets the Lord in the air. Then Israel continues where Acts chapter 8 left, leaves off. They get born again. They have to, they get the New Testament written on their hearts. They get the commandments written on their hearts. And then they're God's people. And they don't, they don't have to be taught anymore. They endure through the tribulation. They sell all their possessions. They don't take the mark of the beast. And they inherit the kingdom. And then they're saved. Okay, They don't get saved until... Christ comes back for them in the kingdom. Okay? Being able to lay that out in a chart is so helpful. I don't know how many times that I wrote down a chart for someone and their eyes opened up and said, Oh my gosh, I can't believe, I can't believe how much you just showed me about my Bible. And that's where you guys need to need to be, so that you can be that ambassador for Christ, and you can give them a quick snapshot of exactly what's going on in your Bible. And then when you have that chart laid out, you know you put the cross in the middle, and you put you know when the Apostle Paul gets saved in Acts nine, which is after the death, burial, and resurrection, after Pentecost. After Israel is shut down in Acts chapter 8, after the stoning of Stephen. And when you show people that, Paul gets saved here in Acts 9. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, majority of it's before Jesus Christ dies on the cross. And you can point to him on the chart and say, why would you think Paul's writings were here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Paul doesn't get saved until Acts 9. That's way after the cross. Here you are in Matthew 5. That's way before the cross. Way before Paul's even saved. Way before any of his, written, any of his letters are written. Why would you put, be putting his writings in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And you can show people this. When you have that chart, you can show them how the errors are made, and how you can clear them up. It's amazing. I always refer to the chart when I'm going through my studies because it, it tells you, puts it in perspective when things were written, when things happened, um, the timeline of your Bible, taking it literally, and seeing how God progresses through it and how He interacts with men dispensationally and it just helps you in your understanding it's it's just amazing it's a tremendous tool in helping me see what God is doing before and after the cross Hebrews 9 15 through 18 and for this cause he is the mediator mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testator is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament, first testament was dedicated without blood. So there has to be a death of a testator for the New Testament to come in. So that means in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, up until Jesus Christ dies on the cross, is Old Testaments, because the Bible says so. And before and after Paul is saved, Acts 7, 58 through 60, and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, 
receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then Acts 8, 1 through 3. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Okay, not the body of Christ. It was the church at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. That's what... Saul was doing before he was saved. And then Acts 9, 1 through 2 says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus in the synagogues that he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And then what happens later in Acts chapter 9? And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, well, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So right there, the Apostle Paul had a change of mind from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. He was persecuting him, and then he asked Jesus what he should do. He changed his mind. Another word for changing your mind would be repentance. Okay? But notice, repentance is never mentioned. Okay? Only a clear change of mind and the Lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless hearing a voice but seeing no man and Saul arose from the earth and when his eyes were opened he saw no man but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus and he was three days without sight neither did eat nor drink and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. Wow. So he did all this evil to the saints at Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem church, not the church, the body of Christ. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto, unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me. Oh, and by the way, wouldn't that be like the fourth time Jesus came back? I still can't figure out this second coming. But anyway, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed, and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ." 
And then, before and after the law, and again, a dispensational chart gives you a clear understanding how things progress through the Bible. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Exodus 19, 3 through 8. And now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will shew thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make them thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And by the way, this is the gospel of Abraham. Paul makes that very clear in his writings that all the earth, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. Okay, Exodus 19.38 And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. Okay, not the church, the body of Christ, but the house of Jacob and the children of Israel. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Are we a kingdom of priests, or are we new creatures? And a holy nation. Are we a holy nation, or are we seated in heavenly places? Okay, clearly, you'll be able to understand the differences when you understand your Bible, rightly divided from a dispensational mid-Acts Pauline foundation and that's exactly what you get when you read this these are words which thou shalt speak unto the children of israel not the church of christ remember you have to take the bible literally and you can when you understand it dispensationally you can when you rightly divide you can when you study it you can when you have your nice chart laid out and Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And then you, you can understand before and after the body of Christ. Acts 9, before and after Israel is scattered. James 1.1 1, 1 and Acts 8.4 tells us who the scattered are. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord of Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So clearly, James is writing to the twelve tribes which were scattered. When were they scattered? They were scattered in Acts chapter 8 with Saul of Tarsus, right? Acts 8, 4. Therefore they went scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. There it is, Acts chapter 8. So again, right division, a chart, a Pauline foundation, a Bible you can believe in as your final authority, a mid-Acts understanding, knowing that Paul started the church, the body of Christ, in Acts 9 by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ and not after man, Galatians 1.11, and knowing that the church, the body of Christ, did not start on a Jewish feast day, knowing what Paul says about holidays in Galatians chapter 4, 9 through 11, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, and Colossians 2, 8, he says not to follow days, months, and years. He says not to follow the traditions of man. He says not to follow the new, new moons, Sabbath days, and holy days. So why would anybody think that the church, the body of Christ, starts on a Jewish feast day is beyond me? When you take the Bible literally and you understand who the apostle is for the church, the body of Christ, that would be Paul, according to the revelation of the mystery given by the Lord Jesus Christ to him to give to us, then you're not going to be confused. Okay. Another great study tool that I've been applying is the understanding of the authors, pastors of books that are written. Okay, And this is huge. This is something that you really need to understand in your study. So... We'll start with my old pastor, James McDonald. He had a Baptist evangelical pre-wrath tribulation understanding, okay? So why would I be surprised with the way he preached, right? How about R.C. Sproul? He's a Calvinist. How about John Piper? He's a Calvinist. How about MacArthur? He's a covenantal Calvinist, Acts 2. 
believes the church, the body of Christ, starts in Acts 2. How about Lachman Foundation? big book publisher, right? Well, they're post-millennial, which means they do not believe in a literal second coming, tribulation, or kingdom. Okay? Now, get that one around your head. How about Matthew Henry? He was a covenant Presbyterian. Okay? He was a Calvinist, Matthew Henry. How about Adam Clark? He was an all-millennial Methodist. How about the Vines Dictionary? The Greek scholars use this. The King James Bible correct correctors use the Vines Dictionary. How about the Dakes Annotated Study Bible? That's the wellspring of charismatic Pentecostal thought. How about Rick Warren? He's the one who invented Chrislam, right? The negative verse remover, right? Only preach positive verses. How about Benny Hinn? He's the clown pew hopper, bow tie untire, right? How about Joyce Meyer? She's the clown break dancer, break dancer, bow tie untire, right? This has been a tremendous help that I did not see before. I read before I read anything and anything, thinking of these authors are Christ, thinking they were Christians too, and that they would help me. I would go to any one of these books to correct my Bible. I would always go, go to these people first before my Bible. Gosh, what would John MacArthur say? Gosh, what would John Piper say? Gosh, let's take a look at Matthew Henry's um, commentary, you know. How about Rick Warren, you know? Really? Now I go to my King James Bible and correct them. Because now I have a final authority. And it's not them. It's God's Word. And it's amazing. For example, my wife one time brought home a dictionary she thought was Christian. I read into it, and it was Catholic. Okay? In the back, it said it was Catholic. And in the front, he hailed Mary the person who wrote this dictionary. So clearly, it's going to be a dictionary that's going to have a Roman Catholic slant. Okay? So it's probably going to have the doctrine, the doctrines of Mary. It's probably going to have things based on their Ten Commandments, not the Bibles. It's probably going to have things according to their Lord's Prayer, not the Bibles. And it's going to have, ultimately, it's going to have the definition according to the Roman Catholic Sinaiticus Vaticanus text, not the Bible, okay? So when you're reading that, you better understand all that because if you don't, you will be led astray. You will be led not to believe your Bible. So, praise the Lord for his word rightly divided, for skillful workmen who teach faithful men to teach faithful men, right? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hopefully, you'll get something from this study, and like I said, I'm going to post something in the near future about charting, and that will help you lay out a study chart that you can have in front of you as you're studying your Bible. Also, take down the notes of the authors that you read that are in your library and make sure you know what their beliefs are because that will help you understand too where they're coming from when you go to their commentaries, when you go to the scholars, when you go to the dictionaries, and when you go to the other pastors that write books. Okay. That will help you in your study to ultimately compare them to God's perfectly preserved word without error, the King James Bible. Thanks again for listening. Email me at reckonyourselfdead at gmail.com. Subscribe to my channel and check out my website at buttnowministry.wix.com slash buttnowministry. Thanks again.